Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, we're really excited to have you. I think there's a couple stragglers coming in. Um, but we're going to try and start on time because we want to leave at least like 15, 20 minutes for questions at the end. I always find that's the most sort of interesting part of these conversations. Um, so welcome to officially the name of our panel. The future is here and it's digital. Um, we're all Columbia University graduates of, in some form. Um, my name is Danielle Maggot and I went to both business school and the college. Uh, this building actually wasn't quite here in its form when I was back at school, so it's awesome to see it today. Um, I'm really excited to be the introducer and moderator of this panel today. Uh, I've been so lucky to get each and every one of these guys to be here today. Some of them came in from California, so thank you to Liz on the end. Um, I've also been on the task force planning this, uh, the entire event, which little did I know what I signed up for when I agreed to do it. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's been a bit of a side job, but it's been, it's pretty extraordinary. We had no idea the reception we were going to get when we started talking about it. Um, and I, we actually feel terrible, terribly because we had to turn so many people away, especially in these last few days. So now the challenge is for next year, how to figure out how to actually make sure the 3,000 or so people that wanted to come that could make it, could make it. Like it's, it's sort of blowing me away, um, the reception and being part of it. Um, so professionally, uh, I actually do have a full-time job on top of organizing this and I'm the Executive Vice President of Global Solutions for Fox Networks Group, which is a division of 21st Century Fox. Um, so that's what I'm doing currently and I'm gonna introduce our panel. Uh, I had it in a different, a little bit of a different order, so I'm gonna start here on my card with Rachel Weber, and we actually have the pleasure of working together. Uh, Rachel is a graduate of Barnard College. She's the Executive Vice President of Digital at National Geographic's Partners, which is actually a division of 21st Century Fox. Uh, she leads the organization's digital product development and technology. There's a lot here, so that, bear with me. Social, um, community strategies, as well as digital storytelling. So that's Rachel, and you'll hear from her and all the cool stuff she works on. Next down the line is Anushka Ramchandani Salinas. She's a graduate of the business school. She runs subscription services at Rent the Runway, where she leads a team of tech, product, analytics, and marketing in achieving the long-term vision of what we like to call this closet in the cloud. Thank you for being here. Next up is the other Danielle, Danielle Lee. Uh, she's a graduate of both the college and the business school. She's the global vice president of partner solutions at Spotify, one of the coolest companies out there, where she leads several lines of business, including product marketing, business marketing, strategic marketing, and creative solutions for advertisers and brand partnerships. And I had the pleasure of meeting her last August, which is a great addition to my, to just my introductions. <laughs> last but not least, we have Elizabeth Ferdin, who works um, sort of with me in the same division, the sales division of uh, Fox Networks Group. She's the Senior Vice President of Business Development. Um, she leads currently deals and partnerships with FNG social platforms, including YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Snapchat, and partnerships with other third parties. She was previously at Google, so I'm definitely gonna ask her uh, her perspectives on working there. She was there for how many years, 10? 10 years. Yeah, 10 years. So she has a really cool background as well. So we've filled out this panel, I think, with some rock stars. Um, so let's get started. Um, today, we're going to hear from these guys on how their respective businesses are driven by what's obviously an increasingly digital world. I mean, with just the reality. The world is digital. It's not going away. Um, their strategies, um, both for personally and also professionally, how they've adapted to the rapid changes taking place, which it seems like every week there's a different change to adapt to. Um, and of course, because of why we're here today, I'm gonna ask them a lot on their thoughts on being female leaders in their respective industries. Um, so those are sort of the three areas we're gonna cover with the questions that we've come up with. Okay, guys. Um, so first question. Uh, you guys are all working with extraordinary brands and companies. Um, some of your businesses are more mature than others. With National Geographic, we have a brand that's 130 years old, and then obviously with Spotify, 
and, and Rent the Runway, they're major disruptors in their space. Um, Spotify already has 140 million active users, which is unbelievable. And Nat Geo is the number one brand on Instagram, which probably people don't realize. Um, I'd love to hear you know, how, you, how you, A, have uh, played a part in the disruption of your company, or B, in the case of Rachel, how you take a 130-year-old brand and make it relevant in today's digital age, and she runs digital. So why don't we start with you, and then we'll go down. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for having us all here. It is kind of such an honor and privilege to come back to school today. Um, so that is the question that we ask ourselves and we pose to the team every single day, is how do we take this brand that is incredibly revered and meaningful in people's lives and make it relevant in their daily lives today and on the platforms that they interact with? Um, I think the what sums it all up is actually if you took out your phone right now and looked at our Instagram handle, and I say that for a couple of reasons. First is that Instagram handle, you'll see that we follow about 122 people on that. The reason we do that, those are the photographers that are contributing to the Instagram. So this is actually, we treat it as a community platform for us. And the way we think about it is we're actually kind of putting our brand in the hands of our photojournalists. So no longer is it just about a one-way conversation that we have with our fans in the community, but it's actually about a two-way conversation that we have these journalists out there in the field. They can, they can interact directly with the audiences immediately. And we have over 80 million followers on that platform. So in addition to it, I think the, the way that we think about how do we make it relevant, it's this kind of platform intentional storytelling. So what is the right form factor for that platform? I mean, Instagram's just one platform, obviously, that we're on, but even within Instagram, there's gonna be a very different experience that you're gonna create for an Instagram Live, which may have a different type of intimate feel for an Instagram story, which you may have a narrative arc to, versus something that exists in the feed, which is gonna feel this kind of permanence and weightiness to it. Um, and the, the, the real sense of kind of creating this, this dialogue is something that we're really leaning into, um, particularly across kind of our owned and operated products that we're building out. So how do we enable our fans to tell their stories? Because I think historically, when, when you kind of conjure up images of National Geographic, you're gonna think about and to think about kind of old white guys out in the field and kind of bringing that reporting back to, um, you know, to, to people that, um, you know, and you're gonna kind of think about somewhat of a kind of colonial perspective. And I think with digital tools and with um, the kind of, the kind of interactive behaviors that we can have on social and digital platforms, we can actually create a community conversation and bring so many different voices to the space. Um, so speaking for Rent the Runway, I think, you know, you have a bit of a weighty challenge when you start as a really disruptive business. You know, so we launched in 2009 with a very kind of novel concept that no one had ever done before, which was, you know, rent a dress for four days for an occasion and pay, you know, 10 to 15 percent of the retail price. The value proposition was pretty clear, but the behavior was pretty uncomfortable at the time. Um, you know, this was Uber and Airbnb, and those guys were just starting at this point in time. So what feels like a more normal behavior now was really not normal kind of when we started. But that said, we've had to continue kind of innovating and staying um, extremely relevant for our customers. You know, that model we've iterated on and continue to build on um, pretty significantly since we launched in 2009. So two and a half years ago, we built a subscription business, which once again, was um, a pretty new behavior. So the concept, for those of you that don't know, is you pay a monthly a monthly fee, you get four pieces of clothing, and you get to switch those out whenever you want. And it seems a bit weird to think about not buying clothes anymore and actually just substituting what you wear to work on the weekends, out at night, you know, to events as well. You know, not just just not owning that stuff anymore and only owning kind of the basics. So we're continuously pushing ourselves to push the boundaries of what consumers are looking for. And I think that's certainly on the product offering that we have, but it's also the service level that we're giving them. We live in this kind of Amazon world where Amazon sets the tone for what we all expect. So where previously we were really just, you know, doing delivery by mail using UPS, which, you know, felt amazing at the time, two-day delivery. Now it's like, 
well, I want it now. You know, I need it within an hour. What do you mean I have to wait two days? And you mean I can't go to a store and pick it up like right away? You know, so we're continuously having to innovate both on the, on the product and on the service that we're um, providing customers. Well, you guys have your store in New York, right? We do. do you have any other um, offline? We do. We have five stores um, in the major metropolitan cities, um, and we do have a pretty high density in those areas. So we're, we're looking, unlike everybody else in the retail industry, at expanding that footprint in a really thoughtful way that makes sense for our customers, because you have to balance you know, the convenience that people want by having things delivered to their door um, in a very frictionless way versus some people actually do want that kind of more high-touch experience where they can go in and try things on and get styled and things like that. So we actually are looking to expand our retail footprint. What kind of growth are you guys seeing on your um, membership su subscription business? Yeah, um, I was actually just telling Rachel that in um, you know this is our second full year. 2017 was our second full year of subscription, and you know in a nine-year-old business, and um, we we were already about a third, 30 to 40 percent of company revenue, and we're expecting to be half of the company revenue this year. And growth in subscription, kind of year over year, we're more than doubling the business, and we have very big plans. So hopefully, you guys will think about trying it. But I do want to add one quick note because I didn't get to tell you this before. I, I joined recently and I had got a dress for my kid's bar mitzvah. So I actually, and I wore the dress. Woo, yes, I wore the dress. I love so it. I'm a huge fan. It's, it saved me from having, not having the time to shop and Amazing. whatever. So kudos. 96% yeah, of our customers are working women. Yes. 96% of our customers work. I think that's so Tremendous crazy. experience, yeah. Um, thank you for that. So Danielle, your business is on fire. Let's, it's on let's fire. hear about it. It's on fire. Let's hear about yes. it. We're all huge fans. So, um, so to answer the question in terms of how we drive relevancy, I think at its core, you know, it's an 11-year-old company, um, and the product really started out as a search experience, right? Search for a song, you play the song. Um, and what we learned is very quickly is that by curating the experience and making it um, super relevant and helping people discover new content, um, is actually meeting a new need. Um, so we started you know, hiring um, music experts to curate um, playlists against specific genres and then against different moods and use cases like working out and commuting. Um, and then the product evolved again. So I think this trend of driving innovation into the platform is really how we've been able to grow and um, become hyper-relevant as a brand. So now today we're at a place where we're hyper-focused on personalization. Um, we still have our human curators um, that you know, deliver great playlists like Rap Caviar and Viva Latino. Um, but then we also have um, machine learning that's creating these very personalized playlists and deliver unique experiences to each of our 100, 140 million monthly active users. So things like Discover Weekly, where we're learning about how you stream, the types of music you like to listen to, and then recommending new content that you might like based on how you listen. Um, we do that with Daily Mix, which is a daily release, um, Release Radar. Um, so we've really started to augment the product with um, these personalized playlists. In addition to that, I would say from a marketing perspective, it's about telling these stories using data, right? So we kind of stumbled upon this, I would say about two years ago, where um, Williamsburg, which we're all familiar with, it's a neighborhood in Brooklyn known for hipsters. Um, the most streamed song in that neighborhood at that time was Sorry by Justin Bieber. <laughs> totally not the, wow. the, the match, right? Wow. I mean, so who we ran the, the <laughs> largest out of home um, placement in that neighborhood called Sorry Not Sorry. Um, you know, Justin Bieber's most listened to artist in, in Williamsburg. So th that we stumbled upon that and, and started to build on that with future campaigns. And so our year end campaign, the holiday campaign, really kind of takes those learnings and really. I would say reflects culture. You know, it, it's a comment on how how we're living our daily lives, but also macro issues like social issues, politics. Um, you know, the, the years that we've been living through the past couple, there's there've been a lot of a lot of um, fodder, and people turn to music to cope, to celebrate, to um, you know, experience all those different emotions. So that's how we've been. Um, you know, staying relevant and, and really speaking to the things that people care about. 
Hey, everybody. It's great to see all of you here. It's great to be up here with you guys. There's such a wealth of knowledge with these ladies up here, but also out there in the audience. I really hope to get to talk to a lot of you later. I work uh, with Danielle and with Rachel at the Fox Networks Group. So that's Fox TV, everything except news. So if you yeah, have any we, questions, we stress for that, that part. We stress that's that another part. Another panel. Yeah. Another panel. No news. Uh, and what we really pride ourselves on at Fox is that it's a company of entrepreneurs. So some of the brands that make up Fox TV are the Fox Broadcasting Network that brought you American Idol and most recently The Four, our newest musical competition show, uh, uh, Fox Sports, uh, FX, which brings great high drama like Gianni, Ver the murder of Gianni Ver Versace, and also National Geographic. So what we do and what we think about all the time is how to great, bring great stories and empower great artists and storytellers to tell their stories out there. And so what we all try and do is figure out how do we get those stories to the audiences that really want to hear them, and how do we make a business out of it? How do we make money out of it? And that's the issues that are truly disrupting our industry right now. Fox is a 100-plus-year-old company. It started as a film company that if you think about it, at the time, in the 20s and 30s when it was being built, those were the Silicon Valley guys of their era. They were thinking about projection. Walt Disney was at the highest end of animation, and he was able to delight and bring joy uh, to the masses. The distribution at that time was your local movie theater, and today your distribution is the supercomputer in your phone. So we're thinking all the time about what to do about cord cutters, cord nevers. How many of you even have a cable subscription anymore? I love my cable. <laughs> <laughs> and we're also really trying to figure out how do we bring value to our advertisers? So for a long time, TV had been ad supported. And you guys may know some of the first TV ads were actually radio ads and the guy speaking <laughs> a radio ad straight into the TV. Now, we're innovating all the time. I'm really proud to be a, a part of the Fox advertising team because we're innovating and trying to capture what we think advertisers and marketers really want, and that's attention. So in this past fall, during the World Series, our uh, president, Joe Marchese, innovated with a six-second ad format. So if any of you are uh, uh, Houston Astro fans, you probably tuned in, had a lot of Dodger fans, sad Dodger fans in LA. During the pitching change, you know, baseball, not the most exciting sport, we were able to let you know that this segment was brought to you by Duracell. A very quick six second uh, uh, interchange, but with that, it changed the industry. And by the next Sunday, every other competing network had a similar ad format there. So uh, we're struggling, TV ratings are going down, uh, but we're, we still know that this is, as one of our leaders, John Landgraf, said, says, is the height, the peak of TV. You have Amazon as a buyer, Netflix as a buyer, in, in addition to the 200 cable channels you have at home. So it's a really interesting time, but a really strained time as well. Well, on the six second ad, why don't you give a little back? I mean, so it came from YouTube, right? I mean, it's really a digital execution, and so, um, on, why don't you, yeah, I mean, given your YouTube days, why don't you explain like how the ads were formatted then and the attention issue and how that's where TV is trying to get to? Absolutely. So as uh, Danielle mentioned, I worked for 10 years at Google, five years at Google in advertising and uh, five years at YouTube specifically, which Google owns. And at YouTube, we would see year after year double digit growth in consumption on mobile devices. So what uh, Google did actually recently, just in January, was that they deprecated the 30 second ad format, which me now on the TV side, oh, I'm dying because I can't run my same 30 second spot on TV the way I, and have it flow through to a mobile device. But what YouTube was seeing was that their users were leaving. They were toggling and going over to Instagram to watch the beautiful Nat Geo photos that were happening if they had to sit through a 30 second ad. And what we talk about in Silicon Valley all the time is the user experience. And that's something that I think we talk about in the TV industry is that we have maybe been disrespectful or forgetful about what that TV ex uh, experience is like. So uh, we borrowed that six second ad format 
from uh, the mobile device, which is now the premier uh, way to monetize digital content on YouTube. And we ported it over to TV in what we think is a pretty ingenious way. Yeah, so I mean, that, that's a great transition, actually, um, to the topic of mobile and social media, right? I think, I mean, as far as mobile, um, you just, you can't go anywhere without seeing someone on their phone. So I would, it would be great if you guys could, sh I mean, you can't separate mobile out from digital, right? They're one and the same. So, um, and then mobile, obviously, personalization is a big part of that. So I'd love to hear from you guys how you leverage that massive speed and growth of mobile, number one, and number two, um, so on the social, what's your favorite social media? I mean, obviously with Nat Geo, it would be probably Instagram, but uh, maybe not, you know, I'd love to hear from Rachel on the methods, of what social media channels are working the most effectively and your guys' thoughts on mobile and social media. And also personally, which one you like the best? So um, at Spotify, the mobile is a big part of you know, the experience. Um, but we've been really focused on um, not just focusing on mobile, but making sure that people can access their music wherever they want to listen. So we spent a lot of time integrating into other platforms. So connected speakers, for example, which is a fairly new um, device, um, voice activated, so you can you know, speak to your Amazon Echo or your Google Home and um, request music. Music is actually the number one use case. So we've been really on the front lines with those partners to develop that, um, that technology which is really leveraging artificial intelligence and um, machine learning specifically. Um, and so mobile is the, the app that you're, it's, it's your mobile app that it's accessing. Um, we also integrate into um, gaming consoles, connected cars, um, you name it. <laughs> we want you to get your music there. So um, when we think about the mobile experience though, and, and specifically music, music can travel where screens cannot. And so we think about, you know, what is the mood and the mindset of the user? What is the experience that they're looking for? Um, and really, it's a, really about understanding um, people through music. And that's kind of what we, we've started to call this um, as we collect so much data about our users. And the way that we're able to do that is through persistent identity. So regardless of whether you're listening on a mobile phone or desktop or another device, you are you. Um, wherever you stream. And so we're able to stitch your profile together from device to device, giving us a much richer view of who you are. Um, and because music is used in so many different use cases, um, whether it's you know giving the baby a bath or throwing a party or you know making dinner, um, and because we have the curation happening on the platform, we're able to glean a lot about our users and really serve them experiences that are relevant to them. Um, when I think about the social networks, you know, we often talk about the fact that music is one of those mediums where you can't um, you can't obfuscate who you are, right? Um, the way you do on social. Um, I can curate a very, you know, pristine persona of, of Danielle <laughs> on Facebook and Instagram by selecting the things that I want to share. But with music, it's, it's so pervasive, right? Um, when you're going through that bad breakup, when you're going through, you know, the, 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 the hard night with the kids, staying up, those, those are situations where you're tapping into music to kind of um, get you through those experiences. So it gives us a much um, fuller view. When I think about the marketing side of social, um, we really use it to, um, one, drive awareness for the fact that Spotify has a media offering. Um, you know, we have a premium business and a free business, and advertisers, you know, run advertising on the platform to connect with our audience. And so, um, me leading the partner solution side of the house, we leverage those channels to really drive that awareness and consideration. Um, Instagram actually is a, a very high performing channel for us. I think the visual nature of that platform um, really lends itself to connecting with one, a younger demo, and um, two, just communicating uh, more. Uh, robust brand message. Um, and then I would say the other thing is the targeting and the measurement um, that is afforded to you in those channels really allows you to help push customers down the funnel um, and, and optimize based on you know what's 
the most effective way to do that. Um, so I can speak for Rent the Runway. I think social has been um, a big part of, of kind of our growth. We've been a very organically growing business. We've done very little paid marketing and social has been a huge part of that. And specifically because people who have these emotional experiences when they feel beautiful and they're you know dressed for an event and they feel like they're getting access to wearing something that they never otherwise might have been able to wear, they share it. And we've seen that kind of internally on our own platform where people at an extremely shockingly high rate share photo reviews um, of themselves. You know, it's like 50% of our customers share a photo review, which is like absolutely bananas. Um, but of course on social as well. And, and they're able to kind of show the emotional side of the business, which for us has been actually really, really, really important. Um, I think, you know, mobile specifically, you know, about half of our business is done on mobile today for kind of the traditional business. On the subscription side, again, it's kind of all about that convenience and being where she wants to be. So over 80% of our subscription customers have our mobile app and use it at least once a week, which I think is a pretty insane stat for anybody that kind of knows the industry well. Um, so, so our customers are highly engaged with us when they when they have a subscription, you know, similar to Spotify. It's like once you've signed up, you know, you're in and you're really engaging with us. And actually, it's really just our job to make sure that you can access on access us on any platform and that it's very convenient. Yeah, I mean, just one thing before we get to Rachel, what's pretty extraordinary is like is how deeply personal and passionate um, what you guys, the businesses that you're in, you know, between fashion and music. Uh, it was such a great point to make. It's just a passion point, and so you have to sort of match the tools, which brings us to National Geographic, which people are so passionate about, so I'd love to hear how you guys tap in. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think on the mobile side, it's kind of gotten to the place where it's just table stakes at this point, and it's a foundational principle in your product strategy. The way we're trying to think about it now is kind of what job are we doing for our users? What problem are we solving for them? And thinking about, okay, well, if you have that, that mobile product for you, what, what can we do for those users in the morning that's going to help them in their lives that they need? You know, is it gonna be that feature or experience from National Geographic that's going to kind of, you know, inspire them that, that, that morning with an amazing uh, piece of photography throughout their day? Or is it gonna be, you know, a fun animal video in the middle of the day that we can deliver to them? And it, it all goes back to being on the platform, being able to utilize the tools of that platform. So if it's on mobile, okay, how do you use notifications, you know, to immediately engage with people there? How do you understand, increasingly understand who those people are so that you're delivering them the penguin video versus the uh, you know more cultural video versus um, whatever it may be and you know so we're, we're just kind of constantly thinking about what what, do you, what seems to be the most what kind of reception do you get which seems to be the most successful or does it vary I think it, it everything varies across platform for us and I think that actually ties to the the social question too in we have different pockets of audiences on each right. platform. So it's all about kind of understanding those audiences, be, audience behaviors, where they are existing and kind of where they're congregating. So something like Facebook, which you know, increasingly from a broad perspective, we see Facebook as a promotional platform for us. It's a lot has to do with uh, the role that, um, you know, the role of Facebook in changing their algorithms. Uh, but we have these very dedicated communities. So we have this community that's obsessed with Safari Live. And it's a, it's a product of ours where we go live from Safari in the Masai Mara every single day. Uh, we go twice a day on Facebook Live. We have, about, we have about half a million people that tune into this. And these people are so hyper passionate. Um, if you know, it, it, it feels like if anyone loves you the way these people love Safari Live, you are lucky in your life. <laughs> uh, but two people have actually gotten engaged off the platform because they met kind of through their fandom of it. That wow. is an amazing use of Facebook for us because we can yep. just kind of reach this, this wide swath. We also have this community, um, or, or another good example, where Reddit was, a, was the right platform for us. Uh, we, I'm sure many of you saw, um, we had a lot of, of buzz and then controversy around a polar bear video that we released a couple of months ago. And 
uh, the our phot photographers who who shot that video wanted to speak directly to the fans about the experience of shooting that their experience of advocating for climate change issues uh, so we took them directly to reddit and did an AMA there and enabled our community to interact directly with those photographers on this issue and around the controversy why don't you tell them the numbers around the community how many people we're talking about uh, so we have, you know, over 400 million um, followers yeah. across social platforms Global. uh, globally, and we get almost 8 billion content engagements every single month on digital. Uh, that's, yeah. it, it, it is truly enormous, and it just shows the strength of, of this brand. I have to say it all comes from leaning into the DNA of what National Geographic is all about. This is not that we're reinventing what National Geographic stands for. We're really leaning into the incredible storytelling, the incredible visual storytelling, and and you know really speaking to um, you know kind of wanting to enable people to explore their world and understand their place in it. Yeah, it's also giving back. I mean, Nat Geo's twenty-seven percent obviously goes back to the society, so you guys tie in um, frequently, sort of giving back to you know the causes that are important. Uh, so it's been great to see you guys harness that. Um, on that point, actually, since you're since you've been talking, I'd love to, and then I'm going to go down because I'm really curious how, uh, well, a business like Rent the Runway is focused on women's needs, right? That's the actual essence of it and how it disrupted the market. Um, but before Rachel goes away, I'd love to hear on that community. You know, since we're here today to gather as women um, l looking to learn, you know, and to form a community, um, how do you at Nat Geo, and then I'm going to go over to Anushka. Um, how do you build a voice for, for women um, using the large community that you have. Um, why don't you just talk about a few examples of how you harness that? Sure, I mean, I'll be honest and blunt about it. I don't think we do it well enough yet. Uh, we are very, I feel very fortunate to be uh, at a company where we have incredible female leadership. Uh, my colleagues uh, who run our television channel, who run our magazine, um, are women. Um, that said, we feel that, you know, you look at our magazine and who the journalists and photojournalists are, and then you look at something like our Instagram is a great um, kind of, you know, symbol of this, um, where we are not, and we're not near gender parity as far as that 122 photographers who I said have the keys to that castle um, and who have voices you know, out there. So um, one of the things that it's about, I think it's about 70-30 right now, um, however, when you look at how you look at the then the percentage of those posting, um, it gets much worse from there. Um, we think there are a few reasons for that. One, just a small example, is we we set up various rules um, to kind of create behaviors on how you can post on Instagram. So there's like a three hour rule. And what we see is that the men are often kind of squeaking in right before the deadline and posting their picture, you know, at two hours, 45 minutes, when a woman has set her alarm clock to three hours and she's very ready to post that picture and she doesn't, she's not getting in there in time. So there's certain behaviors like that that we're actually studying and we're working with our, our community to figure out how we solve. Um, this a couple weeks ago, we um, we hosted our, fem our, our photo seminar um, and brought together a community of emerging female photographers. Um, so we're very involved now in a woman called women a group called Women Photograph um, and a group called Diverse Photograph um, in bringing those new voices to to the table. I think we're we are grappling with how do you solve for these issues, you know, do you kick some of the guys out to, you know, for that 120 photographers? You know, do you expand the pool and just add more women in? Um, so, you know, I'm being very blunt because these yeah. are the issues that I believe, um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to solve together. Um, we're taking a very active approach and engaging with our community to do so. So tons of potential to Huge grow, potential. to grow the voice, the I share mean, of voice, yeah. yeah. I will say one other thing on it, just yeah. one, one pledge that we made uh, this week, uh, a couple of us were at the Makers Conference in Los Angeles, and my colleague Courtney uh, was on stage and pledged that by 2020, um, for our television channel, we are going to um, achieve gender parity in the female-led production companies and creative agencies that we work with, um, as a, you know, because I think we really see, it's not just about us internally, um, uh, it's about kind of the supply chain that we can create and the ability for us to provide female voices an opportunity to be heard. Yeah, I mean, it's about the ecosystem, right, yeah. and all the different companies exactly. that touch the ecosystem and how you influence. Um, 
Okay, so Anushka, you guys solve problems for women, right? That's what you do. <laughs> we sure do. That's what you do. So um, how, I mean, you're, the essence of the disruption is all about that. Um, and is there anything you want to add on how you're, you're trying to actually, I don't know, you know, add, just add layers to that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we obviously started and have continued to be a business that just serves women, and that is continues to be our mission, kind of. People always ask us, are you going to launch pens? And it's like, well, we've got a lot more to do here. Maybe we'd launch kids first, probably. Like, you know, female women are such an interesting customer to serve, and they're, you know, they're challenging, but it, it's a really great customer. And we started, you know, with a solution for women, which was kind of giving them access to these things that they otherwise weren't able to get access to. And you know, the, in 2009, the idea of the brand was we wanted to kind of look like this high fashion brand and look really beautiful. And very quickly, we learned that people were, as I said, submitting photos and giving us these amazing reviews and telling us these like life-changing stories. Like, I got engaged in this dress and you know, just like these incredible stories about how empowered they felt because they were really like dressed for the right, for the occasion. And we embraced that very quickly. I think within the first year of the business, we really started celebrating that in a real way externally as part of our marketing because customers were telling us all these incredible stories and it just felt like this is our brand. Like this is what we, we've stumbled on something so incredible that, and we were so proud of it. And I think we've continued to, to be proud of that and continue to kind of innovate on products that serve that real need for the customer. Um, and, and most importantly, I think we are very in touch with the customer on what she needs. So we do very consistent surveying of kind of what else we can do to serve the needs of the customer. And that's where the subscription business came from. You know, they said, this is amazing for events, but I want, um, I want more. What more can you give me for kind of solving this problem for me for every day? And so we really let the customer lead. Um, and, and by the customer, I mean the woman lead um, kind of our product development strategy. And from the beginning, we've been, you know, by design, a very female-led company. So we have two female founders that have raised you know, over $200 million in funding, which to those of you guys know much about raising money in Silicon Valley, that is an absolutely ridiculous feat for um, a woman to have done. Yeah. Um, and, and our founder, Jen Hyman, who's our CEO, is very vocal about that now. Um, and I think she takes the responsibility very seriously of the fact that she's one of few women out there that has raised this much money. And so she's super vocal. So if you if you Google her in your spare time, you'll see podcasts and news segments of, of her really speaking out about you know women's rights, about um, you know being sexually harassed by investors in Silicon Valley. And she's just like really trying to create that conversation openly openly. Yeah, I've seen lots. It's it's really it's incredible that she's sort of trying to take that on. Yeah. Um, so I mean, we could stay on this question. I know Danielle, do you have anything to add? I mean, I know Liz is going to talk a little bit about the, the investment that she led in the skin, but is there something in particular that on the personalization or on the yeah. targeting the women voice? I would say we don't. I mean, because we're really um, programming to each individual user. Yeah, it's, so it's not really about the women's segment or yeah. the black segment or the Latino segment so much as it is about delivering the experience that um, is relevant to each user. To that person. We have created franchise playlists um, around specific genres that really sort of bring to life different cultures like hip hop culture or celebrate Latin music um, and really built marketing um, programs to elevate those. Um, hip hop is one of the most influential um, genres on the platform. Rap Caviar is, um, I would say, the most influential and prolific playlist on the platform. Um, and so we relaunched that last year. Um, but we also serve those sort of, those genre experiences alongside those deeply personalized ones. Okay. Yeah, of course. Well, I, I think one of the things too, because obviously Spotify is, um, it is such an innovator in the AI space, mm -hmm. um, you know, and using intelligence to create, you know, personalized experiences. And I think one of the topics that's starting to get talked about more and more, but is increasingly important is kind of who is, who's writing the rules of, a, of AI. And you know, you see within the kind of Silicon Valley ecosystem, you know, there's a there's a lot of male engineers that are you know kind of that are 
writing the rules for our computers. And ultimately, it is humans that are kind of, you know, creating the behavioral systems that are ultimately our machines are going to start to uh, kind of create, you know, more intelligence around. So there's a there's a lot of there's a lot to be done, and I think a lot of ethical conversations around diverse voices in artificial intelligence development. Yeah, to make sure the inputs are there for that exactly. actually relate to women. Exactly. That's been a big topic. No, that, yeah. That's a great super point. super interesting. Great point. I think um, one of our women leaders, um, Rochelle King, she's our VP of Design. She actually designs the user interface, um, and one of the things that we really appreciate about her specifically is that she is um, such a human leader, right? Um, and really is focused on the consumer experience. And I think she pushes the rest of the organization to be hyper-focused on that as well. So um, it's less about pulling out specific segments and uh, being maniacal about analyzing the data. We collect over 100 billion data points every single day, right? So we're working with an immense amount of data um, have a team of data scientists that are really combing through that to make sense of it, to, to create predictive algorithms, to, pr to, pr to create um, insights that we can use, um, not just from a marketing perspective, from, but from a product development perspective. But hugely important, um, diversity in tech is something that we are hyper-focused on, I think most businesses um, are, and um, we've got work to do for sure. Thanks for that. Liz, did you want to add anything on some of the really interesting corp dev stuff you've worked on in the past? Sure. Uh, I'm in a, a fairly new role uh, at the company, but previously I was part of the corporate development team, which is the team that makes uh, strategic investments in smaller companies. And uh, using those Columbia connections, I was very happy to get that job, thanks to Rachel Weber, who had the job before <laughs> me. So uh, w during that time, uh, when we look at our Fox portfolio, we are great with guys. Like we really got that sports on on block. But and uh, for the broadcasting network, we really have uh, a lot of moms who love to tune in for a lot of our dramas and content. But when we look at the portfolio, we didn't, we weren't really strong with um, millennial women. And so we were able to meet uh, two co-founders, uh, uh, New York entrepreneurs, uh, Danielle and Carly, founders of the Skim. And when we met them, we really thought, are you guys familiar with the skim? Yeah, most of the room, no. So uh, if you don't know about it, it's a daily uh, digest of the news. I like to think of it as like your study guide for the news. Like if you didn't know what Syria was, they have a great kind of book report that you can think about it. So we led the Series B with uh, the skim, and we were really excited to work with them. The ladies had previously been producers at NBC, and they had actually always written um, their newsletter with the thought to bring it to video. And so we we were really proud. And when we thought about it, we weren't investing necessarily in a newsletter or news content. For us, we were really investing in these two women and thinking about what great students they had been, what great innovators they had been, how they had bootstrapped and done this themselves. So we were really proud. And uh, I think you're going to see some stuff about them in the news in the coming weeks. And we're excited to just see where that brand goes. Um, yeah, those two are uh, incredibly interesting, and it's been a really proud investment for the company. Um, since you did touch on how you actually ended up, you know, with your job and the importance of Columbia, I would be remiss in not asking you guys um, to. I, I think the room would love to hear, since this is a you know room full of alum related to Columbia, um, about your experiences. If anything in your Columbia experience has contributed to you know, your outlook or your preparation for your careers, um, what you took took away, you know, as essential kernels, um, and just generally, like, how, how it affected your sort of way you look at your career and also maybe your life. So we want to start with Rachel? Sure. <laughs> no big deal. No, how no. did this affect your well, life? It could be, be very... Well, no, but that, <laughs> was, that was a bit lofty. That was a bit lofty. <laughs> um, no, I mean, in thinking about this, I first of all, I don't think I'd be sitting up here if it weren't for Barnard. Um, so I did, you go. Yeah, there you yeah. go. I did a, an internship senior year of college uh, at New York Magazine that I found off the Barnard career site. Um, and, you know, in thinking about that, I, I think there's a, there's a few layers that were so important. One was just being in New York City and being in an, you know, in an institution 
that you could be involved in you know, the educational aspects of the institution, the community aspects of the institution, and at the same time take advantage of New York City and be kind of encouraged to do that. And it, for, for me personally, it felt like all of this exposure to the media world in New York kind of honed a bit of ambition to want to get out there and, and be a part of it. And I could do that also at the same time within the cocoon of, of an academic world and a learning world and, and kind of making sense of who I wanted to be within within that professional sphere once I got there. Um, you know, and I think that... Uh, so being here was instrumental. Being like here was... In, yeah. yeah, and I will say that I think it's actually right now. I moved to D.C. about a year ago, um, and it's really the first time in my life where I've tried to tap into my Columbia and Barnard. Uh, I've, you know, I have wonderful friends, but really start to kind of use that community to build a new circle. Uh, because I'm in a new environment, and that's been a really nice thing to to have. Yeah, to and a lot of women that I've met that were part of the Barnard world, um, it's just been a, a really kind of nice, familiar way to enter into a new social world. And then you, two business school graduates, right? One college as well. I mean, how has it helped you? Have you used it? Have you networked with it? First of all, education at its core, um, I think changed the trajectory of my life for sure. Um, I grew up here in Harlem, um, just down the street on 111th and Lenox, and um, went to a, a private prep school, a boarding school for high school. I was in a better chance scholar, um, and and that's what kind of set me on this this road. I don't think um, without my, my education, certainly Columbia and the business school, I would be doing what I'm doing. Um, I actually chose to um, I gave, gave up a full ride at NYU Business School, Stern, to come here. Um, and yeah, and pay for it choice. yourself and go into debt for it? <laughs> I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right you, you and me both. the right choice. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think, one, the brand and the network was, was really important. Um, going to a top 10 business school, I think, in times of economic struggle, um, that's where you really see the benefits of having the degree. I think it sustains you um, when you know companies are thinking about where they're they're going to lay off. Um, and and honestly, I would say the biggest contributor was the leadership skills. You think about the business school, and it's it's so quant focused. Um, but for sure, the 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 operational experience, the leadership, the softer aspects of the curriculum. I think have really sustained my career and allowed me to be a much more effective leader um, and allowed me to accelerate um, in ways that I don't think I would have without it. It's so interesting. I, I want to add, I totally agree with you. Like, Did you take interpersonal dynamics, the class? Absolutely. Right. So there's a couple <laughs> in the negotiating class. There's some classes that are they stay with you for life on how to read people. So I totally agree with you on that one, mm -hmm. as opposed to finance, which I seemingly avoided. For, <laughs> yeah, I, think I took one finance Still. class. Um, so Nushka, what about you? I would, I would agree. I think the leadership, the softer skills were um, the ones that you probably appreciate less when you're there, but the ones that kind of help you accelerate in your career. Um, and I would also echo that I think the brand on your resume means so much and has meant a lot for me kind of throughout the course of my career and building a network and, and really having people take you seriously even before they should take you seriously because they've spoken to you. Um, but on a kind of like specific note for me, two incredible things happened while I was at Columbia. One is I fortuitously met the founders of Rent the Runway the day after they started the business and have had a longstanding relationship with them. Um, I've been, I left the company, was there for four years, left the company and went back a year ago, so can't even get away from them. Um, so that was because I was at Columbia and there was a retail breakfast that I normally don't wake up at eight in the morning for, but I just happened to have gone. And the other is I met my husband at Columbia Business School. So. Ah, you one of those, and dear to you're one heart. of those, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Uh, for me, Columbia has been amazing and such an asset to my life. I am a homegrown Californian. I came here for school. I run right back to California two weeks after graduation, thanks to a friend from Columbia who had gotten a job at Google and referred me there. Two weeks after I started at the college, 9-11 uh, happened, and I think as everyone has said, uh, there is no way to disentangle Columbia from New York and New York from Columbia. And I think something that you know maybe isn't uh, formally talked about at Columbia as much as it should be is the social justice ethos and ethic, and that is something that has always stuck with me, especially being here in Manhattan 
and even a couple of days after having the smoke just come up the island, it was such an uh, incredible time to be here and that sense of community uh, that it wasn't necessarily my community yet, but going through it together, we all came out and uh, I, I just think the ability to navigate ambiguity uh, it was so powerful and something I use in my job every day. So I just really love my friends and Morningside and always coming back to this amazing institution. Do you guys come back often? Or, I mean, I know you're starting to. Do you, are you guys active in? Not, yeah, I think they need to do a better job, especially with yeah, the business school. Yeah, not as school. much as I would like to be. Yeah. Yeah, pulling same, you back same. in. We don't do kind of structured recruiting here, and I wish we did. Yeah, no, I've given that feedback. I was just curious. Um, so... Before we go to questions, I, there's always one question I always like to get asked whenever I do one of these. So I, of course, I'm going to ask these guys this question because um, I think it just open, it's such an interesting question, and that is, um, if it, it allows you to sort of do things over. You know, if you could looking reflecting on your career, if you could do something um, different, uh, or if you could think about something differently, what what would that be? Or do you have no regrets and everything's perfect? <laughs> I certainly don't have any regrets, um, but it wasn't perfect <laughs> yeah. either. I think it, it all played out the way it was supposed to play out. Um, I would say the, the, the main thing for me would be um, strive for excellence, not perfection. Mm -hmm. I think as, as a young woman, um, I was always so focused on, and it, it's mostly because of how I was raised. Um, my father's Jamaican, and I'd bring home an A, and it was, why didn't you get an A plus, right? So it was always striving for that, you know, to, to be perfect. And I think taking some of that pressure off of myself and ac accepting that um, you want to be excellent, but you don't have to have everything always figured out. And honestly, I think having figured that out sooner um, I would have been able to avoid some landmines um, in my career. For example, um, I think women were always very intimidated by me in the office. Um, always felt that they were, not everyone, but some um, peers felt that they were in competition with me. And um, I think I, had I figured that out sooner, I would have been able to be more vulnerable, um, let them in, um, in a different way and um, but did you feel like you gave of off um, looking back a vibe where they you know felt intimidated or did you not recognize that at the time um, I, I believe I'm very warm um, I'm very I'm a very happy I think you person are. in yeah. the office I'm a hugger <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so for me I didn't I didn't see that my you know always being buttoned up and always having the answers was creating that that dynamic and I think you know even simple things like running something by someone to get their buy-in even if you really didn't need it but just the courtesy of it and making them feel a part of what we're building as opposed to um, I'm done with my piece of it you know yeah. I think some of that um, you know I was giving off not, and not aware of it yeah so that self-awareness is really mm -hmm. interesting really key um, Who's next? Who else wants to share something okay. deeply personal? <laughs> <laughs> I think um, it, something that I think everyone like comes to realize, but like it would have been really nice to know earlier, is uh, there's the rules and the uh, milestones people tell you you need to hit, <laughs> and then there's the way the world works. And the two things do not, <laughs> it's very rare that they align. Um, when I was at Google, Google tried to put data into everything and take uh, the human part out of everything, and that wasn't the case. At the end of the day, it's still humans making decisions. The people who run the very top of Google are still best friends with Larry and Sergey, the founders, you know. So there's a little bit of a mer uh, myth of meritocracy. So I think um, uh, that's not to say that hard work doesn't still count and isn't important. But I think as soon as you figure out what's really going on here, who's really making the decisions, and how can I use the tools and the cards in my hand to play uh, your hand, the best hand you can, that's been really valuable for me. So does that mean really sort of being open to what you think the, the way things are supposed to be versus what they really are and maybe opening your 
brain up a little bit more. Yeah. And, and not think you have the answer. So exactly not, uh, and not following the rules too closely, just seeing outside the rules. Okay. Um, I can speak to, I'm, I think similar to Danielle, I have made many things that could be interpreted as mistakes and things have not been easy, <laughs> but I don't regret any of them, including a divorce and things like that. I think you learn from everything and, and good comes out of it. Um, but I would say one thing that I've learned about myself that I think has been interesting and potentially since this is a very high power, high performing group of people, some of you maybe experienced the same thing or maybe you haven't realized it yet, so maybe this will help you. But, um, you know, I grew up in an immigrant family where, you know, good Indian dad was making me, you know, study and make sure I got an A plus on my math, you know, every, every single day. And so, you know, you, you kind of grow to be this sort of checklist driven person that, you know, has to go through and get things done. And I lived the early part of my life, um, you know, many years of my life that way, making sure that I was doing things, the things that, things that I was supposed to be doing and, and, and kind of, you know, making sure you were finishing your tasks. And at some point I started to realize that um, by wanting to make sure I got through everything so quickly, I was losing kind of A, the joy and B, the creativity. Um, and there's actually this really interesting NPR um, podcast on this and I wish I could remember the name. I think it's called Procrastination, but um, it kind of speaks about how if you, um, force yourself to procrastinate just a little bit, you can get actually much more creative results. And this is something that I've realized over the last couple of years that because I've always been someone that's really fast to finish things and really efficient, that I've had to teach myself to sometimes slow down and not complete a task, but actually put it away, think about it, and then I do tend to have much more creative ideas about how to pro solve a problem or handle a situation or build a business or, or all those kinds of things. So that's been, I think, like actually So the faster is not necessarily better. Faster is not better, and efficiency is not always the best way. Um, and I really encourage, if anyone who's interested in that NPR podcast, I will give you the name of it afterwards because it will, it will open your mind. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, one thing I want to address with the audience, like there's probably a lot of people in here who actually are just here for learning and who... I don't know, or, or not necessarily going to go into you know huge, high-powered careers, so to speak, but maybe work for themselves. And so I think all these lessons are really valuable for whatever phase. I like to sort of figure out who's in the audience, right? And and I think they're important for everyone to take away in a deeply personal way for whatever life choices you're making um, for now, which may not involve running huge teams or running big businesses, but they're very relevant for your life, and that's great. So last but not least, um, love to hear from Rachel on what she would do over. I, I think um, the everything has really resonated with me. It's, you know, there's so many mistakes or, or things you do differently, but at the end of the day, you know, I don't regret any of it. It is all, um, it's all been learning and growth, <laughs> you know, kind of another fucking growth experience type yeah. thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Since I've known her, she's had three different jobs, so she likes to, yeah, yeah she likes um, to learn. I do like to learn. Yeah. Um, I think there's something that a mentor of mine told, said to me, you know, I don't know, a decade ago or so, um, but rings true so much for me now that life is long. Um, and it just has this context as far as like, don't burn relationships because life is long. And guess what? That person that you're interacting with now is probably going to be your boss in six months and then you'll be their boss in two years and then they'll be your boss in 10 years. And, you know, the kind of structures and the, you know, the relationship dynamics are constantly evolving and to kind of to know that it's that life is long and that, you know, that people are going to re-enter your life and you're going to want them to re-enter your life. So figure out your way of kind of maintaining those relationships and and really going after deep relationships. I think life is long that, uh, you know, the, the, the you know, moments at 11 p.m. at night when you're crying your eyes out because something didn't go right or, or, you know, some dynamic at work or a personal thing isn't working and then guess what, the sun comes up the next day and, you know, kind of remembering that you can do that and that the, the weight of these decisions of, oh my God, you know, should I pick up and move from LA to DC, you know, for this new job and, you know, like this is gonna define the rest of everything. Well, you know what, it's one move and of course it'll, it'll you know, turn into the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, but, you know, that it's kind of one step so I think kind of constantly thinking that at the same time you know life is very precious and short so you know kind of take advantage of all of it yeah but to give you you took a chance you know and so I think that's an important part of the story as well yeah. just getting up and moving it is a big deal and you take a chance yeah and being courageous in that yeah 
Um, so that was awesome, and thank you guys so much. I mean, I could go on and on with questions, but when all is said and done, it really is all about who's listening and what you guys are taking away and what you may want to hear a little deeper. You know, if you have other questions, uh, we have like 10 minutes. Um, and I'd love to hear from you guys if anything resonates and if you have any questions for any of these awesome female superstars up here. I think, do you want to bring him to the microphone or? Um, yeah? Yeah, so you want to go back. Yeah, why don't we start with you and then what's your, just give us your name. And sure. Then, yeah. um, hi, my name's Rachel as well. Um, I'm C's class of 2016. And I'm curious, um, in the digital and social media platforms that you're working in, um, how diverse is the age demographic that you're able to target and what are your strategies to engage with people and get users to engage from different generations? Do you have a specific person or? Just generally? Oh, uh, well, in general, because there's, um, yeah, I guess in general, if anyone had any comments. Whoever wants to start. <laughs> so, um, you know, we have a pretty broad um, audience, but uh, majority millennial. Um, and so when we think about the growth segments, it's definitely the youth and um, continuing to engage and grow with the millennial audience. We do have, um, you know, a, I would say about 20% of our audience is, is 35 um, plus years old. Um, so when we think about engaging on social media, um, it's everything from um, talking about specific artists um, and content that are coming to the platform. So we do have um, a pretty robust artist marketing effort um, and partner with different artists to promote their projects, create digital experiences, um, do out of home, um, and really c create a, a complete 360 campaign to drive engagement and streams of those songs. Um, and then, you know, I would say the other area is around um, original content. So you may not know this, but um, there's actually video on Spotify. Um, we have original shows. Um, we also have podcasts. Um, so we also promote those. Um, using um, social media and uh, digital channels. Um, and so it's really about thinking about who's the target um, audience for the different um, shows that we're creating. Um, and then using social because of the great um, targeting capabilities that are available and really honing in um, on those. You know, we have, the, I think the big issue that every marketer is dealing with is how, how do I create as much efficiency with my spend and eliminate as much waste? Um, and so you have to get really savvy about um, not just the targeting and measurement, but also the creative. And I think we spend a lot of time thinking about, especially because our platform is, it's a native experience, right? Like every, all the ads that appear in there are native. We t definitely take that approach with um, the type of creative messaging that we put out there. So um, it's a little bit of art and science, just like marketing. <laughs> um, I'm Catherine, and I'm a current student at the School of Social Work. And I just wanted to give a quick thank you to Danielle for her contribution to the app that is keeping me sane while being in New York. Um, I'm from North Lake Tahoe, California. We have one grocery store. It's silent. I live in the woods. And coming here, my brain was just like on overload, like way too stimulated. And so I have a, um, a personalized playlist for everything, like the subway playlist. It has gotten me through my first heartbreak. Um, I have, I'm a competitive I snowboarder, and statistically, I race faster with my music because then I'm not in my head. Um, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and if anyone doesn't use it, living in New York, it's I think it's healthy to like check out sometimes. So just what's use on your Spotify. subway playlist? <laughs> um, a lot of like Michael Bublé, um, <laughs> Etta James, I like it. um, All right. Some Maroon 5, just like, and then they have like the studying playlist, which I've been yes. using here because Michael there's a Bublé. lot of reading Big and it's just like for us. quiet music. Study and focus. Mm -hmm. Peaceful awesome. piano. Check it out. And, <laughs> and workout. <laughs> and workout. There's like pump up workout and then like the hardcore grungy kind, which I like. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. No, no question, just a comment. I love it. OK, who's next? Um, I'm Natalie Kofler. I'm a graduate of, the, of GSAS in 2013. Um, 
on the flip side of this, I'm actually, from a personal standpoint, very inactive in social media. Um, but I've recently founded an initiative in the nonprofit sector looking kind of at the intersection of environmentalism and technology. And it's pushed me into the social media space. And really what our work is centered on is creating a space for a diversity of voices to steer how technologies are used. Um, it's about transforming behavior and it's about um, in, in broadening perspectives. And I just wonder what I struggle with, and this is maybe more for Rachel because I bet Nat Geo struggles with similar things. Um, how can you build soulfulness into the <laughs> online space yeah. so that it really actually changes behavior? And, and on the flip side, um, are there metrics that move beyond sort of number of tweets and number of views to actually know when behaviors are changed or perspectives are broadened? Yeah, it's a great question, yeah. and I love the language that you use to describe it too. You know, I think that word soulful mm -hmm. probably doesn't enter into our conversations enough. Um, you know, I think there's, there's a myriad of ways. Um, you know, as far as the use of these platforms, I think we always have to remember that, sure, there are a lot of bots on the other side, but there are a lot of human beings on the other side. And we have to really be, be intentional about what is the voice that we're bringing to those conversations and how do we, how do we create a human voice? And, you know, I think that we're doing a lot of work to really figure out what our tone of voice is, um, as well as to bring different contributors in and our, our journalists themselves in to engage in that conversation. Because I think the soulfulness is gonna come in when it's less one-way interaction, when it's less monologue, like here's, yeah. you know, push out a story versus here's the dialogue that we can foster. Uh, and I think we can foster that dialogue when we're using the tools, because ultimately we have to, we have to be real that, that you know, millions of people, millions of our fans are on these platforms. So we can't just say, okay, we're gonna turn this off and everyone's gonna have to come over here. It's, it's okay that they're on those platforms. We've gotta meet them there. And increasingly, our journalists themselves, who, you know, are a reporter to our on staff, are going into those conversations and saying, you know, oh, hey, did you have a question on this? This is what I thought about this, so that there's an actual dialogue. Um, that, that's one piece of it. The other piece is actually thinking about the products and the tools that we can build to enable people to have voices. So we have this, this product called Your Shot, which uh, we're working you know, very closely on right now and really kind of reinventing, but it's a tool for photo enthusiasts. And this is for you know this is for the community of photographers out there, and these are incredible photographers. And what we do is inspire them through assignments or hashtag challenges. We get actually 150,000 submissions every single month of their photography, and our our photo editors and our photographers are obviously like the rock stars in their world. And what we're increasingly doing is figuring out what are the tools that we can provide so that they can have direct interaction so that you're feeling a connection to something. And what are the tools can, that we can build so that you can participate in a community, so you can learn from each other, you can have a constructive, you can offer constructive feedback, you can showcase your work to others who may be. And to me, that's, that's when it actually taps into here, you know, and can really become something meaningful in your life. Thank you. And yeah. not that you asked. But no, uh, yeah. <laughs> the w one metric I always look at yeah. in that kind of thing is uh, the share or the retweet. So people right. say, oh, the likes and everything, that engagement. Right. So easy to like it, but to take the time and to tell to your following, I right. care about this, that's the metric I would like amplify in your modeling and give much more weight to. Well, and just one, the thing we think a lot about too, right, is it's one thing to see starving um, polar bears and, and the impact it has on, on our emotions. But then the question is like, how does that translate to changing human behavior yeah. to, to have less impact on the polar bears? And so that's sort of something we struggle with too, is, is understanding how to actually measure impact in that form as opposed to um, sharing the awareness of the issue, so. Really we only have you. five more minutes. Yeah, and there's, I, I know. I just want to make sure uh, that we give a few more people some opportunity to uh, ask their question. Hi. Thank you. Yanni Alexiou, Columbia College 2014. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, about advertising as it's moving away from print and um, television and radio into social media because almost everyone is on some sort of one of the platforms. And it's so great for business because they give you so much granular data about your audience. You can directly target whoever you need to. Do you think that at some point there will be a public backlash to that? Because we make it available, we, we open ourselves up to 
the businesses to know about ourselves, but at what point does that become creepy? At what point will the public say, you know what, that's enough, right? Snapchat is tracking you now on the maps. They know they have the snap to store. It's incredible for businesses, right? But do you think that's going to be a problem? Do you think people will not care about it? Yeah, well, I'd love I you guys. I mean, this is I mean, I think data is it's at the heart of personalization. So why don't you guys take this? I mean, that's yeah. I mean, I'll just quickly say, I think we, you know, Rachel just said, do you think we're past that? And I said, I think a little bit, right? I mean, people, you, the businesses have to give the consumers the benefit of the data collection. So I think like, you know, certainly Spotify kicks ass on personalization. We do a little bit, nothing close to what they do, but people, people are okay. What I found with our business is people are okay giving the information as long as you're using it and giving them some sort of benefit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's absolutely about the value exchange, but it's also whether you've earned their trust and whether you have permission mm -hmm. to do so, right? So um, the consumers on our platform expect and love these personalized experiences, right? Yeah. Um, but to your question, there is a trust crisis happening in advertising. We're mm -hmm. seeing it today. Um, it's all in the trades, what Facebook and Google are, are experiencing, the duopoly as we call them, um, in terms of you know, not policing um, the content on the platform, allowing the you know bad actors to proliferate, um, and really not taking the responsibility. Um, I think our approach uh, at Spotify really is about putting the consumer first, creating those trusted relationships, and most of our ad formats are a value exchange. One of our most um, uh, purchased um, ad experiences is sponsored um, sessions where an advertiser is um, gifting you 30 minutes of uninterrupted music um, in exchange for watching their video advertising. So um, I think when you create experiences like that that are a value add to the consumer, there's a lot more um, trust and permission afforded. Okay, thank you. We have time for one more question. Hi, my name is Elise. You can come up after if you want. <laughs> yeah. My name is Elise Holtzman. I graduated from the law school in 1990. Um, I also have two daughters, which this will become relevant in a second, uh, who are 22 and 19 years old. And uh, so what I do is I do, I run a firm that provides coaching and consulting and leadership work uh, for lawyers and leaders. And one of the things I've been doing a lot of work on lately is about confidence. Right, and how confidence impacts everything we do and how we lead. And so both for, for myself, just to learn about what you guys find useful, and for my daughters as they enter the work world, what do you think um, you have been able to do? What have you learned about both creating your own confidence, bolstering your own confidence, even in situations where you know perhaps people are trying to tear it down or there have been difficult situations. And I ask you that as a panel of women because what I've learned, of course confidence affects everyone, but as you may know, it affects um, women typically more so and people from underrepresented communities. So I'm curious as to how you've great handled question. that. It's a great well, I think one thing is, particularly I hear this all the time on in women's environments, show up prepared. You know, know your numbers, know your talking points, know your transitions between each slide. Uh, and that's going to, you're going to stand up there and kind of know, you're going to bring it kind of from here instead of from here when you feel like you have your material. Uh, that's been one key thing. I think another key thing, and this is not always the case, but to remind yourself, even sitting here right now, to remind yourself, everyone out there, you want us to sound confident. You don't want us to sound uh, like, you know, you're, you're not rooting for us to kind of trip over our words in a sense. And to remind yourself that standing up in front of a board, they want you to feel that way too. They want you to express yourself and be articulate and prove to them that they put you in that position for a certain reason. And so to, to know that in here so that you can kind of bring that into the room. Danielle, you're chomping at the yeah. bit over here. Am I? You look like you <laughs> want to say something. I, I absolutely agree. The preparation is huge. Um, you know, I think that's why I've always been so studied, mm -hmm. right? Um, I didn't grow up the most confident because I was always being told to do better, right? So I think, you know, the preparation is key. I also think affirmations, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. affirming yourself as opposed to letting that other voice in your head get the best of you, right? Like you really need to um, be diligent about um, trusting yourself, trusting your dopeness, believing in yourself, and affirming yourself. 
You should read, I don't know if you guys ever read something called The Confidence Gap, and it's actually two Columbia people, Poppy Harlow and Claire Shipman, who, and someone else, a third person, it came out like two, three years ago, and I circulated it to all my women friends and some coworkers. Did you read that? There's, I haven't read that one yet. It's on my shelf, it's actually. I just read The Confidence Code, which is actually downstairs on the table, um, which was written by uh, two women as well. And it talks about both the science and the art. And what's fascinating is our brains do work differently from men's brains. Yeah. That, that's covered um, in so, this article. Yeah, so it's, it's a really good thing to be thinking about, I, I think, no matter what walk of life you're in. It's very important. I mean, the reality is everyone happens. is insecure, you know? Yeah. And yeah. that's just accepting that and sort of moving on from that. So you read the article, it's fascinating. For kids, yeah. Thank you. I was just gonna add, for kids, one of the things that I did with mine was I got these affirmation cards and they'd each pick one just before going to school. We'd read it out loud and you know have a quick chat about it and then off we go. This is um, a personal question for you because I've been listening to you the whole time and like I said, I do a lot of this leadership work. Have you worked with an executive coach? at all because you sound like you, you because you're so self-aware right you're very <laughs> self-aware and that comes to, a lot of times that comes from coaching because we don't typically learn these things in school right yeah, yeah. I you know I engaged a coach when I was at at and I was worked there for seven years and um, I was the only black um, woman leader in the in the division um, and actually the only black leader <laughs> in the division, not even just woman, and, and woman. But um, my, my peer set was all middle-aged white men. And um, I oftentimes was like, why, how am I at this table? Why am I at this table? Like, what, what is really happening? I had absolutely, had very little in common with, with my peer set. And um, I found that I was getting lost. I found that I was deferring to the, the loudest voice. You know, it was also a lot of sales type of personality, so it was, you know, the biggest voice in the room, I know everything, and that's just not my style, that's not how I communicate, and so I had to figure out how to break through, and so yes, executive coaching um, is a very effective uh, tool. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys, as much as we love to stay longer, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.